This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. Israel is currently in a state of turmoil due to the proposed judicial system reform by the new Netanyahu government. The reforms have caused massive demonstrations from the opposition, leading to reconciliation negotiations between the coalition and opposition at President Herzog's estate. The controversy surrounding the proposed reforms has brought the country's judicial system into the spotlight, making it a super relevant topic for discussions. As you might have noticed from our 150 past episodes or so. In today's episode, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Adam Shinau, one of Israel's most prominent young law professors, who is an avid reform opposer. Dr. Shinau is a senior lecturer, associate professor at the Harry Radzner Law School at Reichman University, specializing in constitutional law and theory, comparative constitutional law, and legal theory. His expertise in various topics related to the judicial system reform in Israel makes him an invaluable guest. Dr. Shinal holds an SJD from Harvard Law School, where he also served as the Clark Bayes Fellow. He also holds an LLB from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and an LLM from Harvard Law School. In addition to his impressive academic background, he has worked as an attorney for several human rights NGOs in Israel and India and clerked for the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, Aaron Barak. Dr. Shinal's research has been presented in leading universities such as Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, the University of Oxford, the University of Cambridge, and the European University Institute, and he has published his work in top-tier journals. We are super, super thrilled to have Professor Adam Shinal on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So I, I th- how do we start? I think we, we've been... Uh, We've had a ton of episodes, as we mentioned, on the reform. Most of them have been guests who have spoken pro-reform. Okay. Uh, so and it's, it's a balanced show. Yeah. yeah. No, well, we have. We've been, tr- we've yeah, been no, trying. No, we've yeah. been trying. I think that's what I was Many, trying to get at. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had uh, a journalist Lilach Sigan on recently. Uh, and I think... And we tried. We invited some prominent uh, protesters, but they all uh, they didn't want to come. But I think, I think well, you know, we're also small time, so I'm yes. not going to hold it against them. Okay. But, but what, I th- what this episode is trying to do is to bring really... It's really important for us to have these kind of conversations with all sides of the, the aisle and, and hear every side. So what I kind of want to ask you first is what's like the most bothersome part for you about the, the, propo- the original proposed reforms, maybe what's left over... Right. It's so the most the most fearsome part. Well, I think one thing, well, the most important thing about the reforms is that it's it's almost a mistake to ask what's the most bothersome part when you're looking at the whole package because the, what's important is the package and what's important is the how the disparate parts of the package interact with one another. If you were to disentangle the reforms into several components, there could be particular components that even I, who I was described as an avid reform opposer, uh, would agree with, or I would even say, you know, I don't agree with this, but it's not a particular problem. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not married to this issue. But the problem is, when you look at the reforms as they were suggested back in uh, November, I think, to 2022, is what you see is the com- almost the complete elimination of all breaks on governmental power, both from, both uh, externally and internally. Externally, what you see is the minimization or the evisceration of judicial review, making uh, striking down laws extremely, extremely difficult and a, a very rare occurrence, if at all. Uh, the capture of the judiciary by politicizing the appointments, not just to the Supreme Court, but to all the courts, the magistrates' courts, the district courts, the family courts, the labor courts, etc. And on the other hand, eliminating or minimizing the internal breaks on governmental power within the executive branch by politicizing the legal advisors' positions and by making their advice uh, into recommendation 
And after those reforms, had they been enacted in that way, been passed, then the important question you would have had to ask yourself, what limits government power? The courts are not going to be able to, break, to put a substantial break in government power. The Knesset will not have been able to put substantial breaks on government power because the government controls the Knesset, otherwise it would not be a government in a parliamentary system. And the veto players within the executive branch who have been able to block some government initiatives will also not be able to do that anymore. And then what you have is a complete concentration of, of uh, political power within one branch. And that is what's the most bothersome part about it. Now, this plan has shifted and changed and, you know, the government has backed down from some components because of the protest. Um, so now we're in a sort of in a different ballgame. And now what's at the center stage is the judicial appointments. So I think everybody's is concentrating on that and, is the, and, they, and they see that as the key to everything else. And if before we get to, because I do want to speak to what everything you said and ask you a few questions about that, but but if the reform was to pass as just uh, the method for selecting judges to to uh, the the makeup of the, uh, the committee. committee for yeah. judicial appointments, uh, would that is there a constellation that that you would see as as uh, acceptable or as you mean not the, the, any reconcilable with democracy? Well, I mean, of course, there can be. There's no one way to appoint judges uh, in the world, obviously, uh, and also in Israel. But I think w whatever system you propose has to be sensitive to the both of the institutional realities in Israel, how the system is structured, and how the political environment operates. So, um, a lot of what the government has been saying is, look, in every country in the world, politicians are the ones selecting who the judges are. That's also incorrect, but let's just suppose that it's correct for some countries. Okay, but then of course the, the obvious question is, what else is going on in that country, right? How else is, uh, is political power dispersed and decentralized, right? And, and all those features that we have in other countries uh, are lacking in Israel. So once you pick and choose and you do all this cherry picking, you're saying, okay, I want this because this is how, I don't know, whatever, the U.S. appoints judges or Canada appoints judges. Well, then you have to ask yourself, what else is going on in the U.S. or Canada? So I, back to your question, I don't think that the committee or the particular makeup of the committee as has been in Israel since 1953 is the only way to appoint judges. But I think that whatever, however you want to appoint judges, especially because of the way that Israeli courts are structured, there needs to be a strong professional, nonpartisan political component in that selection mechanism. And, and even if you want it to be politicized in some way, I don't think it, can, it should be politicized in the sense that only the coalition gets to appoint judges without taking into consideration the professional position or the opposition, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and once you accept those you know, yeah. benchmarks, then we can talk about different institutional arrangements that realize those ideals. And here you touched really, I feel, on the, one of the biggest disagreements and the rifts between uh, right and left and let's let's delve into it a little bit because i from what you s just said i would um, deduce that you your your argument is that up until today uh at least major parts of the committee were not political non non-partisan non-partisan in the sense okay. that they're not affiliated with a party yeah right? but, but but the Politics, look, in the sense of what is political, every institution that decides how to allocate p power is political in right. a sense. Everywhere there is people and where there's decision making, there are considerations that you can term in the broad sense political. And everybody's part of it. So I'm not talking about, of course, that the, co co the, the committee didn't operate like, I don't know, like a mathematical equation. So could we agree that the judges who sit in the committee have political biases? Well, First of all, everybody has biases and every, everybody has values and opinions. Like I said, judges in the committee do not come into this as a blank slate, but they, the interests or the biases that they bring the, into the committee are very different from the biases and opinions and values that the politicians bring into the committee. Now, I'm not saying we should do away the, with the biases of the politicians, but we should also get the opinion of those who are in the system and whose ethos right and 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 their values are also 
based on the familiarity of the system. Because after all, a judge is also a professional, is somebody who has certain capacities and skills. And we want good judges, not just for the Supreme Court. We want good judges for accident cases and contracts cases and tax cases and corporate cases. So I think the knowledge that the judges bring into this and their professional outlook that has been constructed over decades, of course, it has its biases, but those biases are important. Nobody, there's, I don't think any, nobody is saying, I think, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that all the actors or any of the actors in this part are somehow neutral. There's no neutrality, but. But they're not, there's no holding them accountable if they do bring uh, agendas or biases that aren't pure. What, those members in the, of the committee yes. holding them accountable? Well, first of all, what we have to remember and what the audience should remember is that the judges in the committee comprise three out of the nine members. To, the, uh, to appoint a, a member to the Supreme Court, you need seven. Yeah, but so the, ev so the, even if the judges, for example, uh, come together with the members of the Israel bar, that they have five, they need seven. For the Supreme Court. <laughs> for the Supreme but Court. for the rest of the right. courts, which are also the, important, it's enough just... Ju but, the but, judges in the... Yes, But I think true. the point is... The, 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 point is the, the, yeah. ju the judges have a veto on the Supreme Court, but so also do other actors. And the idea behind this, and by the way, this was not always the case. Up until 2008, it was five out of nine. The idea is that we need the political position, we need the professional position, and, we, and because no group has a veto, it forces bargaining, or deals, what's called. And then the deals are the ones that express as much as possible, all the interests in the room. And the people that pass are, are acceptable to all the sectors, which of course nothing ensures great judges, but, they, but, but it ensures the acceptance of different interests that, and, and not just narrow partisan political interests. But uh, so again, we go back to the narrow partisan and I wonder in the end, we, we, that is the, the core disagreement that, that People on the right don't believe that it is that the judges have any special expertise to select other judges. Um, yeah, and, I think that's and, false. And I know, but that's, that's where the core disagreement you would, is. Otherwise, we also have to. Say, if that's true, if judges are just like everybody else and they have no expertise, well, then maybe why do we need law schools? Why do we need bar exams? No, why, I, did, no, I didn't say they no, don't have. No, they don't have any. They expertise. have. They have. Well, they know the law, yeah, right? Be better than maybe the politicians who are not lawyers and otherwise. For sure. They know how courts operate. They uh, have been judges for many years. They know litigants. They know litigant behavior. Uh, they know, they understand the bureaucracy of court administration. They understand how decisions are constructed. They do have expertise. No, I did, I, 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 so that's what I'm saying. I, I never said, and I want to correct okay. your, your, your critique, because I never said they don't have any expertise. I said they have no special expertise to select judges. They perhaps have expertise to recommend, but to that can advise, also be true. But that, can, but that can also be true about a member of the Knesset who is not even a lawyer. Who is this? Is his first time in the Knesset, and true. When, and when he was in true. part part of the public, he but was he, I don't know uh, an architect. True, but he doesn't this, have I want to get to my position. question. Yeah. True, but the member of the parliament that brings to to the question, the member of the parliament does have something special that the judge does not, which is the mandate of the people. You keep. You know, we we keep calling them politicians, but in the end, their profession is an elected official. They're a member of Knesset. They represent uh, they represent the people, and together the coalition represents the majority of the people, and has been uh, uh, has been granted the mandate by the people, and that's what they hold that the judges don't. So judges can advise, they can recommend, they can say, I think this person is grossly incompetent, or this person, you know, is competent and can serve as a judge. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, the Knesset should be able to the the Knesset members or the the elected officials should be able to disregard those recommendations or those uh, uh, that advice, because in the end, if we don't believe in the competency of the people to select competent elected officials to do competent work, then we don't really believe in democracy. Yeah, I don't buy that argument at all for many many reasons. Right. First of all. Uh, there are many, many areas where we don't, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to say trust, but, but, the people, but the people agree that certain decisions have to be made by some expert. So, for example, look, every month there is an unelected official who decides on the interest rate, right? Nagid, the chancellor of the Bank of Israel. Uh, I don't hear you saying, this is wrong. We should have, you know, the members of the Knesset should decide every month whether we should raise or lower the interest rate. You don't, and I think if I were to make that argument to you, you would say, 
No, you know what? I think it's pretty good that an economist, even though economists can differ and it's also politicized and it rests on controversial assumptions, it's not physics, it's not mathematics, and you're fine with that. He so, was appointed by the government. Yes, of course. But also, uh, even if he was appointed by the government, he is not an elected official. And he has, it's very difficult to fire somebody like that. You know, even if he makes the wrong decisions, he's not accountable like government ministers are. So, and, and of course, that's just one example. There are many, many uh, uh, public workers, public officials who make decisions who are also not elected by government officials, who are elected by tenders, you know, by bids, who have... Uh, uh, tenure at work, they're difficult. So first of all, if, if that's your argument, then you have to ask yourself, well, then maybe why do we need all this state apparatus of unelected officials? That's a good question. Oh, but okay, <laughs> yes, okay. that's a great no, but, question. But, but, but you compare oranges and apples because it, with all due respect to all those bid winners in all those government role, uh, government roles, I guess, uh, they're not judges. Judges, especially no, but Supreme I, I, Court. I do want to yeah. go back but, to but, that. But I want to respond actually, specifically but judges, to that. What, what we want about judges, and because they're special, we want them to be separate and independent from the political branches. We want them to have independence in their office. We want it that it would be very, very difficult to fire judges. We want judges to be immune from their decisions. Uh, their conditions are usually set by the judiciary. That's the whole idea of separation of powers. So we do want them to be independent and as by the way as research shows and this is more recent research shows that the more the judiciary is, is perceived as politicized the less public trust that it gains people talk about the low public trust that the israel court has uh, in view of the public what they're also forgetting i think is if you just look across the ocean look at the united states much much lower trust and it's a completely politicized system where the judges are elected by the president who is elected and by senators who are also elected but but um, you just said that the chancellor of the bank, though elected by the government, is completely independent because it's hard to fire him. And the same is with the chief of the IDF and other the chief of the, the police. And uh, so I don't understand what would be the, the issue if a majority in the, in the committee would be led by the coalition. Uh, they would appoint judges as they will. And, and then, then they will be independent. Yes. Okay, so here's so the, one answer to this is that the problem with the judges is that it doesn't end with the appointment process because Israel has about 800 judges. Okay, so 15 of those judges are Supreme Court judges, which means that 785, 90, whatever, 99% are non-Supreme Court judges. The judges who are appointed by this political, would-be political committee, are the, also the judges who are, would then have to be promoted by the same committee. So the independence doesn't end there. When you're appointed to the magistrate court, you want to be promoted to the district court. When you're the district court, you want to be promoted to the Supreme Court. When you're the regional labor court, you want to be promoted to the national labor court. So you, you would still have to go back to the same political committee that appointed you, and they would have to, to decide whether to promote you. So you're not going to be independent. The independence doesn't end there at the level of appointment. It continues at the level of promotion throughout the career. And today, what majority do you need to promote a, a Shalom judge, which is like the lower magistrate court, magistrate yeah, court yeah. to the district court. district court? Five out of the nine. Which means that up until today, for 75 years, ju three judges and two bar associ association members of the committee alone, without the, pol the elected officials, could promote all the judges as they saw fit up until today, which means that up until today, if, if according they, to if your they logic, if, 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 they agreed, if they agreed, but they which, don't always agree. But, you know, they, they, they're pretty much in consensus throughout the years. If you this look was at actually it. recent. But wait, just to okay. finish, the que the, yeah. finish the question. So yeah. well, if I go by your logic, up until today, um, all those biases, all those uh, commitments, and, uh, and, and, and I don't know, how how you would call it but those all those judges who wanted promotion had to somehow please had an interest to please the bar association who has interest in the courts obviously of course and the supreme court judges if they wanted promotion so yeah. all that you said has been happening the only difference is instead of being loyal and to the represent, representatives of the people, they were loyal to the Supreme Court judges. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, if you really wanted to, you could change the decision rule. You can, you can, for example, say that promotions to the whatever the lower courts would also be dependent on a majority of seven of the nine. If you were to change the, that rule for the lower courts, 
I don't think many would protest. I don't think you would see 100,000 people in the street because you changed the vote voting mechanism from five to seven, like you did to the Supreme Court, you would do it to the district court. I don't think that's a problem. If that's what you want to do, fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to come here and, and argue against this. Um, so the second thing is that, yes, you're right in theory, but in practice, that was not always the case in the sense that they were not always in alliance uh, about those appointments. And the third is, yes, you always have to Whenever promotion is um, is present, you always have to look at somebody who has to decide who to promote you. But then the question is, what are the considerations based on which that person promotes? Now, mm -hmm. if the considerations are purely purely political, is this judge one of us or not one of us? And says, is he a Likud member or not a Likud? Not formally, but is he a Likudnik or is he a religious Zionist or is he a Yeshatid or or whatever? What I'm telling you is that not only are you going to get less competent judges, less professional judges, but the perception of the system itself will change. You're going to corrupt the system and change all the incentives, and you're going to achieve lower trust in the court, which is the complete opposite purpose of what the reformers say that they want. If they think that you're going to get a you're going to have political appointments, and then the public will say. No, that's exactly that. Now, look at the United States. You say, well, this is a Trump appointee, so that's pro-choice, sorry, that's pro-life and pro-gun. Uh, and this is a Biden or a, a Obama appointee, and therefore an abortion, he's pro-choice. And, and that's how you see the decline in the public trust in the courts. I, it's I, almost half of that in Israel. I think that that's the mistake, that you're, you're, you're making a chicken and egg-ish like mistake, which is the fact that the system in the States is set up so that elected officials select judges is because that Americans at heart have a low trust in centralized power in one individual. They say, we don't trust the judicial system. We don't want the judicial system to be a strong branch of government because we are very, very true Democrats with a small d. And we believe in the fact that elected officials should have much of the control, and therefore we give the power to the elected officials. So I think the uh, fact that the fact that in Israel you have a low trust in the judicial system is all the more uh, case that we should make this reform because Israelis are also true Democrats with a small d, okay. and they realize the judicial system shouldn't hold that power. I, I think there are some fallacies in that. In, in that argument. First of all, I don't think that's a true characterization of the American people who are true Democrats and therefore they want so, a lot of power in the elected officials and less power in the courts. First of all, America is a huge country. There are different you know, well, factions and, 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 course, and, and yeah. parties and, and, and ideas. And in fact, what Americans feared from at least in the eight, late 18th century, in the early 19th century, is not courts and judges. What they feared was elected officials, right? What they feared was government raising armies and taking control over their private lives. It wasn't judges. They feared presidents. They feared uh, congresspersons. They feared governors. They feared armies. Judges were very, very low in the list of concerns of what they, those feared. So I don't think that what you're saying sits well with, uh, with the historical development of American society. The second thing is, I, I think it's also a mistake to say, as you say, is that now we have this low level of trust in, in the Israeli judiciary. The, the level of trust in the Israeli judiciary is not low. Empirically speaking, uh, first of all, it's much higher than the Knesset in the government consistently over the years. It's three times, there's three times as much uh, trust in the courts right now than there is in the Knesset. And it's not just in 2022. That's what's consistently the case. But the trend and, is bad. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm talking about the trend. Uh, and uh, um, it's much, much higher in, the, in, in the, uh, the trust in the courts than the trust in political parties and much higher in the government. That's number one. Second, the, the level of trust in the courts today is not very different from the level of trust in Supreme Courts in other democracies. So, you know, some are lower, some are higher, but in the end, Israel is kind of in a good place in the middle in those countries. So it's not an anomaly. Now, what Noor is saying, look, but there's a decline in trust. And that is true. Uh, if you look at 1994, there, there was this very big research in 1994, the level of trust in, this, in the Supreme Court was around 79%. It's pretty high. Um, and now it depends on how you measure it. Let's say it's around 50%, but it wasn't always 50%. It sort of ebbs and flows. It fluctuates. Now, is that good or bad that one could ask? Well, one could say, well, look, I, don't, I, I think this is a bad thing, this, this decline in trust. But I also think there's some positive things about this decline in trust. I don't, I think, first of all, I, I think we should be distrustful of governmental power wherever it is held. 
So I think too, too high levels of trust are also a problem. You know, a country that has 90% belief that Putin is doing the right thing or Assad, I, I get very suspicious that this is sort of how manufactured. Now, of course, the level of trust in the court has gone down because the court in Israel makes decisions in sometimes in controversial issues that have to do with asylum seekers, with LGBT rights, with Palestinians. Or releasing rapists like wait, this wait, morning. Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. But that's not the Supreme Court. I mean, that's not that's not what what this reform is about. So the Supreme Court makes a, a, a decision in a, in a variety of cases. Sometimes, not always, not a lot. It also protects what protects minorities who are not very popular in Israel, like asylum seekers, or like how they are called infiltrators, or LGBT or Palestinians. And therefore, unpopular decisions might also lead to lower levels of trust. But in, in a sense, that's also the job of Supreme Courts around the world to protect the rights of unpopular, marginal minorities who don't get represented in the political process. No, so with, all, with the mandate of the people. Right, but when you protect... Meaning you have to protect based on the laws, which of laws course, represent of, of course, the of, majority of course, of consensus. Course you have to protect, of course you have to operate according to the laws. I'm not saying the Supreme Court should be an unlawful institution. But sometimes uh, those decisions are unpopular because really they go against the majoritarian sentiments of the people. But that's why we have courts. If courts were simply majoritarian institutions, we wouldn't need them. You would just say, whatever the parliament says is okay, whatever the government says it's okay because they represent the majority of the people, and we would do away with courts. Right? The whole idea of courts is to limit government power. And if you're saying, if your problem with the courts is that sometimes they go against the majority of the people, then you'd have to give me an explanation. Why do you need courts at all? That's why you need courts. No, you need a separation of power. But, but that's but, separation of power. Wait, you need them to go on. against the majority sometimes. Let, let me let me yeah. respond. So you need a, a separation of power and you need the courts to go against government and the Knesset sometimes. Exactly. But they need to be representative of the people. Right. Oh, well, so that's, okay. So that's also, what does that mean to representative? Now, if you're talking about representative and saying, look, for example, I have a problem with the court. There are a lot of Ashkenazi men on the court, and there are not enough Mizrahi men and women on the court, and the court has to be more diverse. Let's say that's your problem with the court. And or, no, you said representative of the people. No, no, that's not representative of the people. I don't, I don't care to represent people's color or genitalia. Okay, I, care, so, I care to represent people's ideas. Okay, so okay, so forget that argument. So, okay. so, so let's just say you want what you're saying. The problem with God, the, God forbid we live in a country where people, where we want bodies to represent people's no, I, race I, and, and genitalia. I, no, I, look, we, we, this is a different argument, but yeah. I believe there's merit yeah. to what's called affirmative action. And I think, I think also institutions should represent the people also uh, if they're African-Americans, if they're minorities. I think the court should be uh, all the people, you know, all this, you know, ref should reflect Inclusive. the people. There's, there's no should, way it could. No, but right? It, 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 <laughs> I mean, there's it, it, no it, way it could. There, there's no way we can achieve a mathematical precision, but I yeah. think it has to be reflective in some sense of the people that it governs. And I think that's, I think that, I think that's an, an ideal to aspire to. Now, but that, based on ideas and okay, but, yeah, but, we but, won't but, agree but let's, but, okay. but let's, but let's leave that because you're okay. saying, you're saying that's not your problem. You're saying yeah. what, you, what your ideas. problem, what you're saying is, and, and if I, if I want to sort of, under, what you're saying, you probably want to say, the court is full of these uh, left, liberal, progressive institutions, uh, sorry, people. However, the Israeli public is mostly right-wing, and those right-wing positions are not being expressed at, uh, by, the, by the court. Now, yes. I have so several things to say about it. First of all, I think that, and then we're all talking about the Supreme Court, yes? Is that... We'll Let's talk about the Supreme Court. Because we could I also think, talk about other judges. Because I think in the lower courts, that's not that characterization is not correct. Uh, right. I, I, at least I don't know of any research or data that suggests that the magistrates' courts or district courts are leftist progressive. I'm not familiar with any such research. If you are, then I would be happy to, to, to see that research. But let's limit to the Supreme Court. Okay. Because also it's easier to look at 15 judges than 790 judges. Yes. Um, I don't think that's correct. I think, in a way, that might have been correct with the Supreme Court of the 1980s or 1990s or the early 2000s. But when I, Adam Shinal, look at the Supreme Court today, the 15 judges, first of all, I should say, I have no idea what each of them votes. You know, I don't talk to them. They don't talk to me. I do. You know what they vote? Yeah. 
Okay. I, I, I'm like confident I could say <laughs> what they vote. Okay. So I'm not, so, I, I don't know. No, okay. Right. As, no, as, no. as we don't know anything, no, no, I don't I, know I, the world exists, I, I'm just, but I know I, what I, they I, vote. I'm, I'm prefacing my saying, but, 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 but I'm I can, saying, I'm, I think no, it's no. playing in naive. That no, we don't no, know I'm, not, I'm not playing naive. So I want to preface it by saying, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm going to make an educated guess. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be ignorant, but I say, be, 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 okay. So, right. No, no. Okay. Of course not. Of course. If I look, at the judges today, and we can go name by name if you want, mm-hmm. I would imagine that about six or seven of them uh, vote center and center left, and about six or seven of them vote center and center right. And now, if you want to... Uh, you it, have Likud, Likud voter in the, and Shas voter and Yadut Torah voter in the Center, Supreme center Court. right. I didn't say which parties. It could be religious Zionists. It could be Likud. I, I, I would Smotrich, you have a, a, a wait, judge wait, 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 I, 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 I would imagine, yeah. okay, that people like, and I'm naming names, and if the judges hear me, please, I'm not saying that this is what you vote, this is my, <laughs> God forbid, this is based, based, based <laughs> on, based on, wait, based on your, no, based on, because I'm I don't, kidding, I, kidding, I also don't yeah, like this ahead. discussion, why, yeah. and I tell you, and I'll, and I'll, I'll get back to what, the, what, why they vote, but I also don't like this discussion, because if we think that judges have, um, um, professional there's is a professional standard right uh, and if judges is also an occupation that i think judges can also say look i know what i said but but uh, but the law says this way the, and i operate in the law for many many years i i i i've been a law student since since the year 2000 so i'm i've been doing this for 23 years and i know that in many many cases in my career in my life i said look i would want the law to say x but I realize the law says Y, and I can't impose X, my belief system and my biases and where the law says. And I think judges and, and good judges and honest judges are, are also that said. They said, look, maybe in the polls I would vote for Meretz or for Likud, but I'm sorry, but in this case, I have to vote this one, even though politically, I, and I think, so I think the legal system operates as a constraint. There's a sense and it's, it's implied by your questions that once you're a judge, anything goes. You can do whatever you want. I don't think that's true. I think it would, it would be a very problematic thing if that's true. So you in, can, We can agree that there's so, a so, 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 so in a way, So in a way, I think that it's, that, it's, oh, that, it, that it's a gross unfairness to say, look at what the judge votes in, in, in his every, every four years for the Knesset and then see all his decisions. And I can give no, you... But, but we and didn't, I can, we and didn't I can, take it no, there. And I can give you many, many decisions of judges who are identified as leftist judges, who in many, many instances vote in a way that is not leftist. So, wait, so, okay. Okay, so, so I, I think that's important to say. No, but I just want to make the point that we didn't take it to the where but, it no, votes. But My it, original but question implied, was why implied. doesn't the Supreme Court represent so ideologically I think it, okay, so I think it does. the I, people? I think, I think, so I think if you look, so again, what does that mean? Is Why isn't there a judge yeah. that, is, that, like you said, w- sees the world from a Haredi perspective? Okay, so first of all, there have been judges in the past that have been Haredi, but um, there are other, there are, actually there are problems with appointing Haredi judges to the Supreme Court who have nothing to do with the committee. First of all, the pool of applicants is much, much smaller, right? Because Haredim don't usually have law degrees. They study. Oh, but they have now more. No, no, but but it's a, first of all, it's a recent pheno- It's a relatively recent. And when I was a twenty student, years. When, but yes, but you don't. But you don't appoint somebody to the Supreme Court when they're thirty-two, right? Yeah, even when I when I studied in this in, in the I studied in the Hebrew University. Um, um, so so and, 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 and we were a class of about two hundred and forty people. In in the year two, between two thousand and two thousand four, I had one Haredi student. Okay, so today that Haredi student is maybe he's my age, he's 44, he's 45. Um, you still don't appoint people to the Supreme Court when they're 44. Okay. That's so so, so, so uh, it's also That's difficult legitimate. to get Haredi people because they don't have the path. And S- same applies for Tzionut Adatit, the no, religious Zionism? No, and that's why, for example, you have David Means, who's from Tzionut Adatit. You have Noam Solberg, who's from, who's from the, you know, both settlers, Kippas, uh, from that camp as I can identify. But you have, no it, you, you have, you have Yitzhak Amit, who uh, now he doesn't have a kippah, but he grew up in the institutions there. You have uh, uh, Yael Vilner, who's a religious Zionist uh, uh, woman. So in a way, actually, for example, settlers are overrepresented in the Supreme Court. There are two settlers in the Supreme Court, two out of the 15, but there are only 500,000 settlers 
you know, in uh, who, uh, settler, settlers, settlers. So, right. so, I, I, so it's not just about Likud. Now, uh, I think that's the main issue. Though, so for you, because, so you, for so you, because it's the biggest party in Israel. Okay, so first, so so for you, Noel, you would say, look, if we got four people in the Supreme Court, and they were Likud supporters, in however sense, I'm happy. I I, I do away with all this reform. I, I don't need to change the committee. Not that's, exactly. That's a problem. Not exactly. I would. I, I want to have a say, and I want you to have a say, right? And I'll be fine, like, if, let's just say, for the sake of the argument that you're a merit supporter, and let's say you went to a national campaign in the elections and, and got 60 mandates, and now you appointed four judges who think like merits. I'll, I'd be, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd deeply respect it, and I'd be, I'd be much happier than today. Okay, so I'm not, I wouldn't be. Even, even if I were to be a merit supporter, I wouldn't want that. Because I think the Supreme Court, as an institution, should not represent naked political interests. If, 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 I, have, if, if I have a Supreme Court who's a merit Supreme Court, or a Likud Supreme Court, why do I need the Supreme Court? I have the Likud in the Knesset. Because, as you said, we trust, we appoint, I, I, I trust my elected officials... And, uh, and I think we all should, to elect judges, no matter the agenda, that once they are judges, as we said, but that's, that, wait, wait, yeah. that they will uh, judge according to the law. And as you said, judges are professional. So but you can't have it both ways. If you think judges should judge according to the law, yes. then it doesn't matter who you appoint. Because they all judge according to the law, right? But that's and therefore, the it doesn't problem if it's a mandatory code. I think that's the problem, and you, you we touched it briefly previously, that today... I, I strongly disagree with you when you say the judges uh, judge according to the law. I think one of the biggest disagreements today in Israeli politics about this issue is that we in the right feel that judges in the Supreme Court, more often than not, do not rule according to the law. They rule so, according to agenda. Okay, so, so, so I, wh what I, when I hear this argument, my, always, my, my immediate intuition is to say, you know what? I understand. I think it's really important the, w the word that you use. You said, me and the people on the right feel, feel. We feel this is as if this is some, an emotional issue. I feel that this is what they're doing. I am sad that this is what they're doing. I'm upset that this is what they're doing. Maybe we can take that feeling and leave it to one side and talk about concrete cases, real cases that the Supreme Court has decided that, you would, that we, you would, we would test this feeling. But in the end... Your, feelings are important, end, but no, we shouldn't but, devise systems but based on feelings. No, hold on, well, of course feelings. we should. In the end, you can prove, quote unquote, whatever you want, and I can say I don't buy it. And that's why we know. We haven't had that argument. No, but yet. I'm saying uh, we can have that argument right now. But I'm saying in the end, what Noah is describing is what led people to the polls. And, and in the end, we had an election. Yes, and that's fine. Of course, I. Th I there's an election. Nobody's disputing the results of the election. That's fine. Okay. But, but, what, but what I think yeah. is that, and this is, goes directly to what Noel said about feeling, I think, and... and, and that the feeling and, and, is disconnected and, and, and from apologies the Apologies for, for if, if this sounds no, no, go uh, ahead. condescending. No, no, I think a it. lot of the discourse about how the court operates is really removed from the reality of what the court does. People, and, and I understand this completely, if I were not a law professor, I also would not read Supreme Court decisions. You know? let's, let's talk about uh, the, uh, the asylum seekers here. In, in South. We're in South Tel Aviv. It's yeah. all the more topical. Um, let's talk about asylum seekers. Can you tell us a bit about what the uh, decision is that the court, uh, that the court arrived at and how, how it's perceived by both sides uh, and where which, you think? Wh which let's, ones? There were several. Le let's go with the um, Saharonim uh, jail, yes. for example. Okay. So the... the um, the, the background for that decision is that uh, years ago, uh, because of uh, uh, the, the situation in Eritrea, in Darfur, uh, there were many, many asylum seekers uh, coming to Israel. Not just to Israel, by the way, to many, many other countries in the world. Actually, a small part came to Israel. Of course, most of them ended up in other countries. Um, at the heyday, at the peak of uh, asylum seekers entering Israel, uh, there were about, uh, I think, about 50,000. Now today, by the way, it's much much lower. Many have left. It's around. It's under thirty thousand today, uh, according to the Ministry of Interior uh, record. Not including children. No, it is including children. Yes, yes, it's including. Look, look. look Never look. mind. Okay. This is the governmental data. I'm not making up data. Okay. This is not. You know. Um, anyway, um, and the government uh, had to decide what 
what what are they going to do with them? Okay, so the government actually settled the asylum seekers in South Tel Aviv. They had buses waiting for them, and they dropped them in the Vesha Anan, in the Levins, Ginat Levitsky, and they said, go settle. The government didn't think to put them in Metula or in Gedera or in Petah Tikva. It said, this is where you're going to be, creating problems. Yeah, no. Problems for the residents, right? So, okay. Um, now, the problem is that there were people coming in. Uh, at the time, the, uh, now it's not the case. Uh, at the time, there was no fence. There was no wall under, along the southern border. And by the way, since this fence was constructed, there are no, no, nobody's coming. I think there are about maybe 10 people coming per in a year to, mm -hmm. to Israel. I mean, that, that, the, the problem with the, the situation with the asylum seekers has ended. Nobody's coming anymore. Uh, f uh, through Egypt to uh, to 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 Israel, uh, the pr uh, okay, um, but back then the 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 fence was uh, I think was in the initial stages of construction wasn't completed, yeah. and the government said what we're going to do is we're going to lock up these uh, asylum seekers which the government has called infiltrators it amended the infiltration law. Um, and uh, it locked up um, the men, I think, right? Only yes, only men. And but the the capacity of the Saharonim facility, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was around uh, 1,700, 2,000 people. Only right. now, of course, in a way that didn't solve anything because you had 50,000 people. So even if you had 48,000 people outside, that would not do anything. Um, and the under the the, the 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 law, you can lock them up for three years. Now, what's important to realize is that none of these people's people were charged with any criminal offense, right? They weren't indicted in court for anything. The government said the government said we're not going to charge them anything, and these people were not candidates for deportation. The government didn't say, you know, I'm afraid they're going to disappear, and therefore I want to put them in this holding facility until they're deported. The government said, I don't want to charge them with anything. They didn't commit any criminal offense, and I don't want to deport them back to their country or any other country. I just want to hold them here and, 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 and limit their liberty for up to three years. And after those three years pass, we will release them back into southern Tel Aviv. Okay, so... They legislated this law. Yes, that's what I said. They, yeah, they, they, amended, the, they, they amended the anti-infiltration law. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, of course, it was, a Knesset, it was a Knesset law. We're talking about 2011, 12, something like that, 10? Yeah, some, something like that, okay. I think. Yeah, and the law said? That's what it said. The law enabled... The, to lock, the, them, the, up the, to lock them up for up to three years without charges without charges and without be, them being subject to deportation just saying you know here you have a life or whatever and of course what's also important to realize at the same time is that the government refused to check whether these people are refugees right these people came and they said we're refugees now under the refugee convention which israel by the way is a signatory to the, and it was actually Israel was very influential in drafting the refugee convention because of Israel's Jewish experience with the Holocaust. Under the refugee convention, when an asylum seeker comes to your country, um, the government has to examine whether that person is an asylum seeker or, or, is, or is or is not a refugee. If that person is, is a refugee, he or she is entitled to rights and non-deportation. But if that person is not a refugee, then the government can deport him. The government has consistently refused to examine the status of these asylum seekers. Up until today. Up until today. Why? It's very easy to guess why. Because the government knows that had it were to examine, it would have to grant refugee status to many of these people. How do we know this? Because the same group of people who came to other countries, Greece, Italy, Germany, were a lot of them were recognized as refugees. Although now it's changing a little bit. But, in some but, of the but we're, talking about, yeah. we're talking about the... 2011. Yeah. Some countries, it was 60 or 70 percent who recognized refugees. Some countries, it was 35 or 40 percent. There were precedents. In Israel, it was about 0 0.0001, like one or two people recognized. So, so this is the important mm -hmm. document. Israel said, we're not going to fulfill our legal duties. We're not going to examine your status. Uh, we're not going to deport you. We're not going to indict you with any criminal offense, but we're going to lock you up for three years without any charges and then release you to the same population from where you came in southern Tel Aviv. What is... Now, we'll come to the legal case. Uh, a group of asylum seekers petitioned the Supreme Court, and they said, look... Via an NGO. Yes, of course. But that's fine. Um, I mean, that's... that's Depending who you ask. 
why is that a, I don't know why is that a problem it's the isn't it but it's how do you call no 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 it, 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 it has it, nothing it, it, to it, do it's standing rights say that you don't have standing you're not important but it's perfectly fine for an NGO or anybody to represent a person who has standing these people had standing because they were the one who were being locked up okay. so of course the law harmed the rights and they, yeah it, no but it's an it's a different problem which is the fact that they arrived directly at the Supreme Court but that has nothing to do with the reforms that are being passed or anything. Yeah, the fact, well, it, no, it doesn't have nothing to do. It has nothing of, to do because it has because, nothing to do with the proposed original no. proposed reforms. But it's not something that, let's say, Yariv Levin or other people have been talking. About. If the proposed reforms were about changing the architecture of the the, the way you appeal to the Supreme but Court, but that's fine. But that's not. We're talk, but this is a, a fantasy situation because that's not that's the case. Nobody's suggesting that Yariv Levin is not no, suggesting no that. Got, well, no one's talking about the other three parts of the reform either anymore. No, no, but this was not even what you're saying. That's, yeah, it's no, not I'm, even part of the three parts anymore yet yeah yeah look if you want to talk it's about another that, problem we, with the judicial system but that's a problem which many reform which many pro-reform people yes, would but, love to get to but look if you want to talk about that we can talk about that but that yeah, was not we're what we're digressing okay. okay, and, okay, and okay, by okay. the way the only the reason <laughs> no, the, i'm just the, i'm just saying but, but why the, the reason the, the so, reason the supreme court is the yeah. first court they appeal to is for two reasons first of all this is the system we inherited from the british okay not a great reason yeah, but that's 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 okay. No, many, I'm just saying it's not a great reason. <laughs> but this is not the fault of Aaron Barak. Okay, this is what I'm saying. Okay, Aaron Barak was was a kid when this happened. You know, no, I didn't. Uh, oh, bring no, up but this Aaron is always Barak. okay. And in 1984, Israeli the Israeli Knesset, the people, enacted basic law, the judiciary, which gave Bagats that power, those powers. So it was the people who decided. Mm -hmm. Now, if the people want to change and say, okay, fine, but that's not, anyway. Okay, look, those so people, the, as I said, look, you're 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 violating our rights. Mm -hmm. What rights are you violating? Well, there is a basic law, basic law, human dignity and liberty, that the Knesset passed as well. That said, every person, not citizen, not resident, person, person, has a right to liberty. And if you you can infringe that right to liberty, but that infringement has to be for a proper purpose and it has to be proportionate. And those asylum seekers came to the Supreme Court and said, you're infringing our right to liberty because you're locking us up for three years without trial. I and think it's disproportionate. And every country, I think, and I think you too would say that, that the, the ta you know, locking you up for three years without trial. Is Citizens, a, yes. Persons is, a, is an infringement of their liberty. When, when, it, when, it, when a country puts you in prison for three years and doesn't charge you with any criminal offense... If you're a citizen, yes. That, no, then, it, then it's, it's infringement of your liberty. A liberty, no. it's not an infringement of your liberty? No, it's an infringement of your liberty, but I don't know how many liberties you have as, not, as, as someone who's the not Israeli, a citizen of the country. The Israeli Knesset decided, yeah. and this is the people decided, yeah. that in Israel, every person has liberty. By the way, when the Israeli Knesset wanted to limit rights to only citizens and residents, it said so explicitly. For example, in basic law, freedom of occupation, chofesh aisuk, you know, the right to pursue an occupation and vocation, the Knesset said specifically that this right is limited only to citizens and residents, not to tourists, not to people who happen to be here. But the Knesset chose differently in liberty. It said, no, persons. Persons, and by the way, the United States also they, uh, also said persons as well, and, 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 but whatever. So what did the court uh, rule? The court said that... Uh, the court, first of all, wanted to understand why are you locking these people up? Since you're not deporting them and you're not charging them with anything, why are you doing this? They asked the state. They asked, of course, they asked mm -hmm. the state. And because, in, in a way, they have to ask the state. Why? Because basic law, human dignity and liberty, demands that the law be enacted for a proper purpose. So you have to ask the state, what's the purpose behind enacting the law? And the state said, we have two purposes behind the, behind the law. First of all, by removing a segment of the population from southern Tel Aviv, it will make life easier for, for those living in southern Tel Aviv, uh, welfare, crime, all those things. And also, what they said is... It'll if, deter. Yeah, if you lock these people up, then people who are not here at all, but maybe think about coming here, we'll see that when they come here, they will be put in prison and... There's uh, a chance they'll be put. Yeah, there's a chance that they will be put in, in, in a prison and then they will decide, we don't want to come here, we want to go elsewhere. To, yeah, to Europe. Okay, I think those, both of these reasons are problematic. Um, okay. empir empirically, but, but the Supreme Court accepted both reasons. Uh, first of all, the Supreme Court said uh, that they, it, it understands why it wants to ease pressures on people in southern Tel Aviv. Uh, and that's and we'll leave that to one side. And the court even accepted the deterrence. And the deterrence argument, I'm just going to maybe say, it's very very problematic, because you're using people here to as an as an instrument to 
deter other people who have nothing to do with the people who are in prison right now. You're just using them, right? It's like almost saying, you know, uh, we want uh, Lebanon to release some sort of prisoner Israel has, so we'll kidnap, you know, let's say Lebanese children, and we'll just keep them in prison here until we release them. We did that. Yeah, I know. That's also problematic. Uh, uh, not, not Lebanese children. Well, but, no, uh, a few of them were children, actually, in those groups. They were under minor, age, under, under 18. There are, there are, minors, yeah. 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 Okay. We would, okay. I would not, think, not a seven-year-old. No, but I, I think we would still think, if when I look at 14-year-olds or 16-year-olds, I still think of them as children. Maybe you don't, but okay. Well, it depends what they did. But, uh, but yeah. they didn't do anything. Okay. But, um, but anyway, uh, we're, again, we're digressing. So the verdict. Yeah. So, the, so, so the court said... You're infringing on their liberty. Uh, by the way, the state agreed that it was infringing on their liberty. Uh, the yeah. court, the court uh, accepted uh, the purposes behind those, uh, uh, the purposes that I just said. However, the court said that given that this is a small number of the population, and given that you didn't really show that it's actually going to deter anybody, uh, because let's just say if you're fleeing from a genocide, then the fact that maybe you will be in a prison for a couple of years, you'd still prefer that than, of course, being a victim to genocide. And the fact that you're not really alleviating the problems of southern Tel Aviv because, um, uh, you know, you're removing 2,000 people, but you're still leaving 48,000 people here, then locking them up for three years is disproportionate. And therefore, even though in principle you could lock them up, the term of the detention has to be lower. And that's, and that's a decision. Now, you can argue whether you agree with that decision, but I, what I don't think you can argue that it's, that it's baseless in the sense that it's unmoored or divorced from the legal situation. The court didn't come in and say, we're going to make up this law you know, and, and we're going to make up all these requirements. No, the right to liberty is a classic legislation. The proper purpose is classic legislation. The requirement of proportionality is in the Knesset legislation. That's in the Knesset. That's the people decided. But at the end, if we look at this verdict, what uh, tipped the scale is not uh, is is something that's very subjective, which is proportion. What's proportionate and disproportionate? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, and, right. This is in the end. This is the main thing. Like. Because another uh, three judges, I don't know how many people sat in this. Uh, there like were more th than three judges. Five, maybe. seven, I don't remember. But I think there were seven or nine. But, but anyway. you would change the political identity of those judges and the verdict may could have been different because in the end they relied on... Okay. Can we agree about that? I, I, I would... I would I would agree with some of that. First of all, I would say that this is also true in other cases at all. It's, it's also true, for example, in a way that you interpret a contract, a commercial contract between two people. Yes. You know, one judge may interpret this in one way and judge in a... Now, in the sense, law is not a machine, right? It is not... Uh, 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 you know, so it's, it, it, it's not a mathematical formula and we accept it. Why do we accept it? Because it's inevitable. It's inevitable in any other reasons. So yes, we accept, I think, the idea that in some instances, but not all instances, proportionality will be controversial. That some judges would say, I think this is this and I think this is. But in the end, we need to have a system where we think about what justifies the limitations of rights and what limitations we can live with and what not. And what you say it's subjective, but the Knesset decided this. The Knesset says that limitations on rights have to be proportionate. The Knesset gave the court the power yes. to evaluate... The same Knesset uh, wanted to pass okay, the wait. reforms. So, 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 I th so, so in, in, in a way, I don't think what the court did was illegitimate. The court interpreted... The Knesset, whether, but I think a lot of the people are... Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Said. A lot of people argue that the Knesset didn't give the power to the Supreme Court to, to knock down laws for unconstitutionality. I think, okay, that's a different argument. And I think you, I, I think if you read Basic Law, Human Dignity and Liberty, which I assume both of you have read, it's a very, very yes. brief and short law. Uh, I think it's very hard to understand the opposite of what you're saying. The, the, the Knesset has said specifically that uh, no law should violate the rights in the Basic Law unless the violation is, among other things, proportionate. That's in they, the law. And then they kept it vague. They kept but, it vague. They but left the it for interpretation. Yeah, but, 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 but by the way, 
there's nothing anomalous about this. Uh, the idea of proportionality as a, as a mechanism to limit rights violations is accepted throughout the world. Canada uses proportionality. Okay. Germany uses proportionality. European Court of Human, uh, uh, Human Rights uses proportionality. Uh, uh, South Africa uses proportionality. India, I can go on. Yeah, a, but, but Israel didn't make anything. And in fact, when Israel adopted proportionality in the basic law, what it looked at was it looked at Canada and Germany uh, to get the idea about how to do that. Okay, but no problem. I can accept that uh, the Even, proportionality yeah. exists. But I think it, the reason I brought it up is because previously you said about how uh, uh, how law is a profession and political agenda uh, doesn't mean like you need to rule one way or the other, that judges rule according to the law, etc., etc. And I think this is a very good example with this instance about how your political agenda, you know, you are, they are human beings. And I think we can agree that there is a chance that in such a ruling political agenda could maybe unwillingly uh, play a role. So, and assuming yeah. we can agree about that, that brings us back to the, polit to, to, to the fact that I cannot uh, influence um, via democratic means the, who will be the judges. So I think there are so, 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 so some things. First of all, I think you're a little bit mischaracterizing what I said. I never said that there is no biases and values and ideologies but I said law is not only that that's what that's what I said and therefore okay. to completely equate law with politics I think that's not a true characterization of how law works okay, even if, never even if I look for example at that decision the in the asylum seekers decision um, there were different judges who I don't think vote the same way who reach a decision or for example, and we won't get into this right now even for the dairy decision right now the the 11 zero or 10 one decision, You'd see also religious judges saying this, secular judges saying this, Mizrahi says, you know, saying this, uh, right, more right-wing settlers. So I think... So let's keep to the Saharonim example. Okay, right. So, okay. Um, and I think... Uh, so, first, so, so first of all, I... So yes, of course, there is a value system, belief that influences to an extent somehow, but I think, again, that's inevitable. But I think what you're doing yes. by politicizing the judiciary, if you're going to make the judiciary uh, um, a partisan affair, first of all, what you're also, I think, forgetting is that, is that the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, most of the cases are not constitutional cases. Most of the cases in the Israeli Supreme Court are administrative appeals, criminal appeals, civil appeals, right? Contracts, torts, uh, what, bankruptcy, taxes, um, rape, murder, whatever. Um, and when you're politicizing the appointments of the Supreme Court, you're not saying you're, you're going you're to politicize all these other cases as well, right? Uh, which you would, I think, agree that there's a very strong professional component, com component in that cases. In many, many, in, 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 in many, many yeah. European countries, you have political appointments to the constitutional court. But that's only a constitutional court that does only constitutional law. The Israel Supreme Court has 10,000 cases per year. Very, very small number of those are cases challenging the constitutionality of Knesset legislation. And also, as you both of you know, the Supreme Court, we can talk about how activist it is in many, many cases, but intervening in Knesset legislation is actually not the areas where it's been most activist. I mean, in the 30 years that it's been uh, overruling Knesset legislation, it has only repealed 22 provisions of uh, one, yeah, but I think uh, under one per year. The argument against that is that many of them don't because of Never the exact reached. issues that you but that, that you delineated before, which is like the advisory, the legal advisors to the government but, but, can stop. But I, I want to get back to, to yeah. the, the, the example. So my question to you is this. What do you say to me, okay? I, I, say, I come and say to you, okay, I read this verdict and I'm not interested in a Supreme Court that rules this way. Because it it doesn't fit my agenda. I want uh, the the asylum seekers to be in jail for three years. That's what I want. And let's okay. say I can form a majority in the people who want that. Okay. Yeah. How do you suggest I go about making the change that would enforce my will? Okay. First of all, I think, and this is a more general argument. Or I wish I say I'm also, even though I'm an avid uh, reform opposer. 
I'm also not happy with many court decisions as well. I mean, and, and we should also keep in mind that the people who are now protesting are not saying we like the Supreme Court and we like all the decisions and therefore we, uh, 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 we want to keep it the way it is. I think the Supreme Court in many, many occasions has underprotected human rights. Okay. Okay. So I'm also not happy. Good. And I would also like the court to have different decisions. So the argument that I would tell you is that this is not about particular policies because I also reject. It's about how you design a system. Now, you say, I want the, the, the asylum seekers to be locked up for three years. And I gathered a majority that agrees. I would say to you, okay, I understand. But I think you would also agree with me that in a, in a democracy, any democracy, the majority doesn't get to do what it wants always, right? If, for example, you gathered a majority of 61 uh, Knesset members and you didn't want to lock up the asylum seekers, you, what you would say, I want the asylum seekers to be my slaves. Mm -hmm. Should we let you do that because you have 61 or 70 members of the Knesset? Yeah. You think so? I think that you're going to have a tough time maintaining a democracy in which... Let me answer. In which 70 uh, mandates want that and you're going to suppress that. I don't think, and you're going to suppress that desire is what the end of that sentence was. I don't think that 70 mandates in Israel want to own slaves. I believe but, but in the not, competency but, but, and in the demo. But this is not my question. And in the, but, but, but I'm making a, yeah. but I'm making a more hypothetical. A hypothetical. So I'm saying hypothetically. But, but, but it's also not about Israel. I'm saying hypothetically, you, you can't design any system that will protect itself against a majority mandates. slave owning des, uh, desiring population i think that's wrong <laughs> you, you I, can you, I, then you what you're claiming is is anti democratic you're no. saying let's suppress the will of the majority for for, I, I, for sure i i think there are some cases where the will of the majority should be suppressed by the way that's what basically constitutions do constitutions create structures that what they do is limit political power of to an majority to an, it's always to an extent this is not a zero sum game but it's only the, by the willingness of the people of course uh, i agree 70 mandates so, so. even if we had constitution 70 mandates who want slaves could rebel and take power that's the that's the thing who could, like who could rebel the 70 mandates who want my, slaves yes but my, you're talking about the technicalities of what will happen but my point was to illustrate something different mm -hmm. that even you we, uh, you agree that... But we don't th agree. No, I think that you don't want a purely majoritarian system. Of course we do. You do? Yes. Yeah. You want that the majority can do whatever it wants. If the majority says, you know, uh, 61 members of the Knesset said, no, again, women I, should never have the right to abort their children, that's fine well, with yes, you. Yes, yes. And now I think that uh, uh, I want checks and balances in place, but if the, if the, whole, the majority... But the hold, whole on, idea, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want to answer you, just because, just so you don't think I'm some radical, uh, that which you might end late. up thinking anyway. <laughs> but I... I, I do want checks and balances, but I want the majority to be able to insist and then get what it wants. Okay, so I disagree with that on many, many issues. First of all, I disagree with that conception of democracy. I don't think, that, I don't think that's, a, that's an accurate description. Right? Democracy is never, what was never, and it, it will hopefully will never be rule of the majority. Democracy literally means rule of the people. So not, not, not rule of 51% of the people, okay? You're saying, rule of 49%. 51% if you have no, a majority. I'm saying, so then what, what percent of the people is it? No, so what I'm saying is if you want to maintain democracy, you have to have the idea that, that the majorities have a limit on power, right? Because democracy, is, if you want to have, uh, if democracy is really the rule of the people, then for example, you would have to concede that every person is equal to another person. Otherwise, you don't have rule of democracy. You don't have rule of the people, you have rule of a privileged class, right? If, so, if there was a group of people who got two votes, in the kalp, in the polls, you would say this is not a democracy, right? If all Ashkenazis had two votes and all the Mizrahis had one vote, you would say, would Israel be a democracy? No. Mm. Okay. If the majority, if 61 members of the Knesset decided that Ashkenazis should have two votes and Mizrahis would have one vote, would Israel be a democracy? No, but it would be a democratic decision. It would be a democratic decision to end democracy. So I think that... And it, it would be legitimate. So, it, it, so I don't think it would be legitimate because I, cause I, don't, think, cause I don't think devolution into non-democracy is legitimate. But you can't force democracy on, an, on, on, on a country that doesn't want democracy. But I'm not asking democracy you, isn't worth I'm, anything I'm not, if you I'm don't. not asking you what you would force. I'm asking you, you're asking me how I would, how would I would see the system. 
the system would not be democratic because so, democracy rests on some assumptions. But I could, okay, so I could say, you know, democracy is rule of the people, exactly. meaning the not just the Israeli people. I mean, who defines the people as the Israeli people? So maybe democracy, we should take into consideration the will of the Lebanese and the Syrian people. Well, I think I think they have I, zero votes in Israel. I think I, th I think that's so. Different. Aren't don't we already kind of have a system no, where we I, have more votes than no, the Lebanese we, people we, in Israel? No. So we have to define the no, people. No, no, no. So, well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I think that this is a totally different issue. And I think there's the answer to that. Every country, every political system in the world, actually except for Israel, is defined by physical borders. The government of Israel uh, has... And in every country, democracy is defined by majority. Wait, wait no. But you go to the elections, whoever wins, it's not, no, wins. No, 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 no. The majority is a way to... Uh, to it's a decision-making procedure given that there are... Uh, disagreements among the people. So we think that majority, uh, the majority is the instrument that we adopted in order to channel the preferences of most of the people. But that it's very, very dangerous to equate that rule of the majority with rule of the people. Democracy, literally, again, demos is people. Demo, yes. it's, not, it's not majority. So, the, the, so what we, so we adopt the rule of, the, of majority decision making because we need to in the end of the day That's we have the only to, way we have okay the best I, way I, we have. and i'm not and i'm not arguing to against, represent the will of and, the people and i'm not arguing against that arguing against that decision making procedure but i'm saying we should also recognize it for what it is it's an instrument that we use as a proxy for determining how or for de, for deciding policies when there is a conflict among different groups of people however we should not forget when we adopt that principle that democracy is still a will of the people and therefore even if you are in the 49% or the 10% or whatever in the minority you still have what we call rights that the majority cannot do whatever it wants to you it cannot no, but that, put you that's what i'm saying is that and that's, by the way, and that's every country in the world. Yeah, yeah. It, it accepts the, the idea the, of the of, rule uh, of the majority as a way to 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 hash out conflicts. The the issue is, I think, what you're highlighting is just that if the conflict is too deep, then there the, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have a system in place to protect the minority. If the conflict between a majority and a minority is we want to kill you, then we're not gonna. Nobody's gonna agree to be like, wait, wait, wait. Let's vote on this. Let, <laughs> but we want to kill but, but, you. But I think you're. And we have more people, so we're gonna kill you. Of course, resorting to violence. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? The the issue in your example is the nature of the conflict. Yeah. Once the conflict becomes too extreme, it, democracy gets I, thrown out the I window. Don't, I, I don't think that's true. I think you're portraying a zero sum game or a binary situation. I don't think that's true. I think first of all. If we accept the idea that people have rights, not people of Israel or not Jews or people generally have human rights, civil rights, political rights. If you if you think that rights have a meaning, whatever meaning you have, it's another I think, if core you, issue. If, if you think if you think that there is such a thing in the world or or such a thing in countries to have rights, then there is no way to understand rights as being purely majoritarian. The whole idea of rights. There's the, no the, other way. No, there's no, there is the whole idea of rights is that this is something that I have that is beyond the people's control. If, if for example, today, I, after doing this podcast, I want to, uh, 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 let's say, go and eat ice cream. I know this is a silly example, maybe, but... Now I have to eat ice cream. Uh, uh, put it in my and, head, and, I have and, to eat ice and, cream. And, 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 and uh, people would say, yeah. look, you have a right to drink or eat pretty much whatever you want. Uh, you live in a democracy. No, nobody can tell you uh, when to eat schnitzel or when to eat uh, the, or what TV show to watch or or I don't know uh, how to speak. Except to for your, except for your wife. Or how to uh, or <laughs> how, how, how to speak to your daughter. I, I don't know. Yeah. The whole idea of rights that we have this is 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 our very deep sense that look, I don't care what sixty one members of the Knesset say, and I want to have ice cream now and if now 61 members say no you cannot eat ice cream now or at all or you cannot you know uh watch a tv show then we're no longer living in a democracy they yes. so, so, so right so the idea of a democracy is not only we have this instrument called majority rule which by the way has a lot of problems as well with it how do you d d decipher majority rule etc etc i don't think the israeli government the israeli's political system does a good job of, of, of translating majority will uh, but that's another issue um we have this thing called rights and the and but they derive from a consensus 
Right, but but they, the, you're, but, not, you're not born with the rights because because if well, you that's, the that, rights that, in that, a democracy. That's, that, that, that's that's first of all, that's a different argument. There are there is a school of thought, a respectable school, school of thought, of thought that, yes. that, that that goes back centuries that the, that says that there are such Natural things that you're rights. yeah that you're endowed with mm-hmm. rights as a person regardless of whether you are a citizen or re- a resident. But reality or, tells us it's not true creator. because in Afghanistan, uh, no, of course. it can help no, that they were f- born with those rights, but they don't have them, but, right? right? And so, we have them because we took them. So, no, but so, it's so a let's say, so, let's say yeah, 50, yeah. so even if 51% of the Taliban say, you know, women has to have to wear burqas, women cannot go to school, women can be, I don't know, raped at whatever moment. Uh, you know, you could say these are all democratic decisions because most of the country is Taliban and 51%. But I would think you would get very skeptical. No, because you don't have free elections in Afghanistan. But even if you had free, let, let's say most of the country is Taliban and you had free elections. And you yes. said, and, 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 and you would do all these things, torture, non-education, rape, uh, uh, forced dress. Mm-hmm. And you would say, look, it's Afghanistan, it's an amazing democracy. No, I, it I, wouldn't I, be I, amazing, I, I, but it would be a democracy. So I think your view, okay, is completely out of step with the way that modern constitutional theory views what democracy is, because you're reducing democracy to only one thing. Free what, elections. What, whether 51% agree in free elections yes of course 51 no in, it's in, not in, it's not obvious no in election. Because in russia you don't have free elections no. in iran you don't have free in elections in, in free in, i i'm, I'm okay. happy to go along with with, the, with to stipulate free elections okay i think that a uh, modern democracy accepts the idea of majoritarian rule as a result of free elections but it also accepts the idea as do almost every Demo- almost every democratic country in the world has that there are also limits to what majorities can do. If you say, no, there's no limits, okay, so you're proceeding on completely different axioms than I am. What can I tell you guys? I don't no, know. I, I think we don't, we don't disagree on the fact that we have natural born rights that are, uh, but in Israel, like, like I said, yeah. I, and, and as it's written in the American Constitution, that are endowed to us by our creator. I mean, to no, each, but to I'm, each I'm his own even, whether or not he believes. I don't even, I'm, 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 we don't even have to go to the theological debate whether there's a God. No, or I, know, God. I, know, I know. So I'm saying even in Israel, I'm saying even it. in Israel, we have rights. Yeah. Because partly because the Knesset decided that we have no, those rights. Natural yes. born rights. I'm no, not all natural. for it. They're political. They're, they're, no, no, no. But I'm saying yeah. we, I'm going back to the philosophical discussion of natural born rights yeah. versus non-natural born rights. I, I I think that there are natural born rights, but it is on humankind to 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 flush out what are those rights, I right? I completely agree. And so we're talking I, I about think, what I, system do we I think also judges are also part of out. humankind, right? Yeah. Okay, so I think there's an important role for judges Meaning to interpret... The idea that we have natural born rights, like going out to eat ice cream, isn't necessarily a human right. You know what? Even the right to live is questionable at some times. We have, you know, there's okay. debate but in all kinds of societies about... I think, we're, about, started, about I think, the I think ec- we're digressing from the idea. So the, 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 the question is, what is the role of judges? Now, yeah. in many, many countries, I would say, I'm, 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 I, would say I am saying that in about 90% of democratic countries in the world, the, uh, the people in those countries have said, we want to decide on how we do. We realize there are limits li- to, to governmental power, to legislative power, and therefore we're setting up these institutions that we call courts, and the courts occasionally will say, stop. And that's, hap- that's the situation in 90% of democracies in the world. Now you're saying, we don't want... It's a debatable... No, this is a true. fact. This is an empirical fact. But other, other people are stating that the empirical fact is that 32 out of the 36 OECD countries, are at the, the uh, selection of judges is by the people or is somehow indirectly or directly... Uh, I think the selection. Selected of, by. I think I think the ju- selection of judges in Israel is also by the people. First of all, the people. Who, how do we have this decision mechanism in Israel about selecting judges? The it's people. Fifties. But the people like, decided, uh, right? You agree? Yes. The but people now decided. The people want and to the, change uh, it. Okay, no, fine, no, fine. Dead, and dead I, and people I, I, decided. I, 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 so I mean, like, uh, we could say, you know, 
my Look, my uh, me I don't but, know but if that, if, if, killing but, my next door neighbor the people no, decide this is but, how cavemen but, did it they okay, decided but, but, if that, that's, I mean, but if that's your position like, then you should take a much more radical position and you should be completely anti-constitution the American constitution should be thrown to the garbage bin why? because it was enacted by really really no, dead there's people there's ways to amend the constitution not in America in America there's it's, way to amend no, in, 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 you, the, you could pass an amendment no, there's, there's like 30 something amendments to the no, constitution no 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 Actually, well yes and no it, it, it's extremely impossible it's, it's extremely difficult to pass an amendment to the constitution and that's why there are only 27 amendments to the u.s constitution you need to have two-thirds of the house of representatives yeah. two-thirds of senate and three-quarters of the states and that's why the american constitution is the most difficult constitution to amend in the world which de facto means that but they managed to amend that, it 27 times which is nothing which is nothing in the more than 200 years. They, once went, a decade. they also went to war on it. Right. But, and, and lost. And, and, and 500,000 500, people died, so you can get three amendments, 13, 14, <laughs> 15 minutes. So the majority of the people in the United States right now are for much stricter gun control than is possible. But it doesn't matter that they're 51% or 55% or even 60% or even 70%. But if they were 80%, yeah, then you Yeah, but look, would. the majority in the US cannot decide on their own because they have to have 75%. It's ridiculous. But it's, if it's, enough wanted, they could. But what enough? But you were, you were right? five minutes ago, you were extolling the virtues of majority rule. And look how even 55 or 60% or 65 or 60 yeah, But the difference cannot, is we don't have a constitution. No, wait a second. So, so, so and, and you're, and I think you're enamored with America but look in America the people don't govern right the, the, who governs a document from 200 more than 200 years ago which is almost impossible to amend so if you're really true to what you're saying we should do away with the American Constitution law. now about Israel uh, first of all the people decided how to appoint judges in Israel it was the people it wasn't the judges it, we had a different system between 1948 and 1953 we had political appointments in 1953 the, the people of the Israel through the representative decided differently in 2008 they decided we wanted to change it again and now we want to, so let's get to today and, and finish and, this and, uh, and, and, we and I think the people are entitled to mm. change the election system I'm not saying they're not entitled the question is not whether they can in, uh, change the committee the question is whether the changes that they want to 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 bring whether those changes will do good to the system will make a better supreme court will make a better court will increase public trust in the court okay but i think no and all this discussion has not been about whether people have a right to change the committee of course they can change the committee but i don't think these changes are good okay. to the system which leads me to the last question yes if this government uh w were hypothetically to pass the reform the four laws as planned the original ones if they were to pass it would you um, accept and acknowledge the right to do so? You mean whether do I think the Supreme Court could strike down these reforms? Is that the question? No. What do you mean? You, what do you mean? Accept the right? Would you? Would of you? Of course, the government, the, the Knesset has. Do the, they have the mandate uh, and the legitimacy to pass the four laws? Legally, in your opinion. Legally, no, in your like legally, in, but I'm giving you a legal opinion. Okay. Legally, opinion in uh, uh, formally yes. Okay. If they yes. have in the, in enough members of parliament to amend basic law the judiciary they can legally amend it but the question is whether do i think and that's why i asked you the second question do i think this supreme court should repeal those reforms is that the question my question is i i, I don't like no, no. How, how, how many do they need in order to amend 61 actually no no because um because uh most of the most of the amendments are uh, amendments to the basic law to judiciary and basic law to judiciary is not um entrenched uh and therefore you can have actually uh under uh, simple, simple, simple majority, majority. Yeah. but it will have less chance of being ruled down if they get 61 some some might argue but never mind but no but i'm asking beyond legally because legally who knows who knows what the supreme court would have done but in your opinion as 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 a law professor but not not according to the law in your opinion as a citizen as a citizen would because one of the arguments we hear from the protesters is that they don't have the mandate to do this this yeah. and turn us into but, dictators. But, but, but i think I, th I think okay I, I think you have to understand the protest argument in a different way in the sense that you know all of what you're doing now was never discussed at length and, and that's why right. i think they're okay. saying we didn't vote on this okay it's a, 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 so i, I so I, I, let's assume we had another elections now. Okay. And it was about that. And again, we, we had 64 okay, so, mandates. So, so, would you... so, so, I th so I guess I would tell you, I think that uh, if we are putting the legal considerations aside, which I do have something to say about those, but let's not say anything about those right now. Um, I think that they would have the legal 
capacity and le legal legitimacy to pass these laws. But in a, but I think that were these laws to pass altogether, I think these laws create the infrastructure for completely limitless, unchecked governmental power. Okay. And, and the substance, and when I look at the substance of the laws, I think these, the, the, especially all of them together, I think these laws would not be legitimate as such in a democratic, in a country that aspires to be a democracy. Okay, but having uh -huh. said that... That was your question. Yes, no. but having said that, morally you would think it is legitimate. But what does that mean morally? If, if my moral commitments are that Israel continues to be a strong, robust democracy, then morally I would oppose these laws. Of course. You would oppose the laws. Yes. But you wouldn't oppose the, Knet, the majority's right to pass them. Well, like I was said, I think that legally, I think the Knesset can pass them, but I would reject these laws. And insofar as possible, I would try to resist those laws because I think these laws turn Israel into something that I deeply and profoundly disagree with. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for coming for on the indulging. show. Uh, no, yeah, for thanks, indulging. Thank us. you for having <laughs> yeah. me. It was a pleasure. I think that's the right good, word. I think it was a good discussion. <laughs> yes, yes, very much. And, and we I don't think, hear such discussions, yeah. I think, in Israeli media at all. Well, it's hard to have a discussion that goes on for more than an hour. Also yeah. true. So, okay. That's why we love this format. So, thank uh, you so much. Thank How you. Can people, thank you. Like, reach out, follow you, social media. Well, uh, if anybody Google's my name, they will reach my website and there's my email. I'm on Facebook, but I'm also on Twitter. My first and last name, my, my picture is there. You so. have a bo book, something to uh, plug? Uh, I'm not plugging anything right now. Actually, okay. my, my current project, which I hopefully will turn into a book in a few years, is the history of censorship of films and theater in Israel mm. between 1948 and 1991. It's a fascinating topic. We it could is. discuss that. Yeah. Uh, when uh, it comes uh, out, so, yeah. Yes. So I, I work a lot in film and theater censorship um, in the early decades of Israel. Uh, and I'm, that's my current project. And I'm hoping to, there's an article that hopefully will come out in the next few months. And then it will later turn into a book. Fascinating. We'd love to have you and talk happy, about it. Happy to do it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so much for much. coming. Thanks Professor very much. Adam See you guys on the next one. Thanks for listening. Bye.